been more or less supporting myself in photography since I was 14. I was still in school and I was living in a little town of Dunn by then and I had a bicycle with a basket and when I would when the fire trucks would roll out and they would I would hear that they were going to photograph a I mean going to put out a fire in a tobacco barn on the edge of town. I would ride my bicycle out to the edge of town and photograph the tobacco barn burning down. Come back, develop the film, send it send the print off on a bus to the Charlotte Observer, to the News and Observer, to the you know and the next morning the pictures would be published. I was earning money all along, you know, five dollars a picture is what they would pay me for publishing a photograph that I would send to them. But hey, it bought me a new camera, bought me a, uh, bought me a roll of court and a speed graphic and all the things that we held in high esteem in those days and little by little I just made a living, you know, and every now and then I do some kind of portrait for somebody. So, you know, just just little menial jobs in photography. And so you just keep chipping away. You know, it's a day-to-day -day thing. But then, uh, but when I was graduating, when it was my senior year in high school, I knew I did not want to go to college. And I just wanted to be out. I wanted to see the world and be a gypsy and get on airplanes and go places and do things and so that's what I did and you know for the next many 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 decades lived all over the country and I'm now 78 just on the cusp of being 79. I like middle-sized towns not I don't want to live in a I don't want to live in a Charlotte or a New York or Atlanta. I like the look of Wilson it was pretty People were friendly, it was affordable, made a lot of sense. Um, I didn't know a soul here, not one person that I know. But it's also very practical, it's, it's on high ground, it's close to uh, the Triangle, so I think of the Triangle as downtown, if not Greenville. So I came here and looked around, met a few people, liked it, people were friendly, so here I am. So I've seen just about every phase of photography you can imagine from, you know, in terms of the history of the medium. Um, I mean, the only thing I didn't do was wet plates and daguerreotypes, to, you know, but, uh, but uh, I mean, but I've used the most backward possible equipment and film and all the rest, and now using the very best of digital equipment that money can buy. So I've seen all that happen. My first and only paid full-time job was on the News and Observer. I've, never, I've always been a freelancer since then, even though I was under contract to, you know, different people different times. You know, I was always poor. I had to make a living, so I, I, was, I was both lucky, but I was also very determined. I mean, I had to, I had to produce, and I still do. You know, I made that kind of a concentrated body of work. Um, years before the Greenville Museum came here to visit my studio and see the work on the walls. And then when they did and they saw that and, and they uh, made note of my history in the 60s and Martin Luther King and the funeral and all that and all the things I'd been through in the 60s. Um, and seeing the current work with the, with the black folks, they uh, invited me to um, consider doing an exhibition in Greenville for which I would do a lot of new portraits of contemporary African Americans from all walks of life that had stories to tell about how they'd gotten where they are. I would go and go visit their homes or uh, hang out with them for a, you know a few hours or half a day or something like that and get to know them and, I'd, and get them to tell me about their lives and what they'd done with themselves. And, um, you know, often it's not ever bring tears to my eyes. You know, the stories that Stacy has to tell about um, her child being kidnapped and, you know, the people in, in a state out of Kentucky, I think she was living in, and the, 
the people that work for the state were telling her, just have more children and keep applying for jobs you know you can't get. You'll get more welfare. That's how you can support your family. Now that's no way to live. That's no way to tell somebody how to live, you know, to stay on the dole. Just keep having babies and don't try not to have a good job. How is that going to make a person have a better life? So you'd hear, I'd hear stories like this over and over again, and, and you know, and, and uh, so I would invite them to the studio to, to tell me their stories and on camera, and I would photograph them as they were telling me about themselves, and, and, um, and that's how the pictures came about. He's been in the studio on several occasions. I've done a lot of shoots of Theophilus and, and, uh, and his other friends, so, and we'll continue to do more. It's actually going to be a whole new body of work. But a picture like this took most of a day to shoot by the time we get in and light it and it's done with you know strobes and a camera on a tripod and a lot of trial and error stuff with the lights to get it right. But he he served time too, I forget for what, but, but he's working a lot with, with young people now to uh, to mentor them. And he's these, these are all people that are working a lot with community outreach. They bring people in and they get to know them. They'll just take time with them, you know, tell them how to sort their lives out. And his, his, his hair is one of the visual signatures. But what he's done, he's, he's now come out and he's working with um, a lot of kids, mentoring them and making life better. And boy, what a gorgeous person she is. This is the dress that she wore to Barack Obama's first inauguration. This is the ball gown she wore to his inauguration. And when her, her great, great, great grandfather, who was a slave, was freed, he was given you know, he, he, was, he was given a little money, and he took some of that money and he bought some land on the outside of, outskirts of Farmville, enough to have a, fun, uh, to have a, a, uh, a graveyard. So he uh, decided to come out there and light it. And so I spent a, off and on, I mean, a, a couple of different days I went out there and I would scout it. I, would, and I knew that I wanted that tree in it, and I knew that it had to be lit like that to have that texture, and I wanted it to play off against the detail in her dress. You know, you gotta bring poetry to something like this. Uh, you gotta bring a little drama and a little theater and a little poetry to it. So, you know, my tools are light, so that's what I do. Is this not a statement? He, he, was, a, he was a butcher in New York City, and she was living in New York City. And he fell in love with her, and he wanted to buy her a hat, and he bought that hat on time. Uh, he bought it in a store in Harlem, and he bought it on time and paid for it over a period of time, and then he gave it to her. And these are the clothes they got married in 28 years ago. The most interesting thing that happened about on this shoot was when we, we had it all set up, and the you know, all the days it took to arrange the hats, having been done, get all the ladies all dressed in their, in their chosen costumes. Each one brought in several outfits and we got them all, got it all organized and, and styled. We'd figured out all their poses. And then when we, <laughs> at the last minute, looking through the viewfinder, I realized that a hat over here needed to be changed. It needed to be moved a little bit. So the fellow that was helping me went in, a, a, a black guy who's a director of music uh, at one of the churches here, went in and bent over to, to move one of the hats. And when he did that, this lady here grabbed him by the fanny. <laughs> Pretty much almost picked him up off the floor. And all the ladies just went crazy. Oh, wow. And that set the tone for the picture. And so and it was nothing but laughter from there on out. But they were a lot of fun to be with. I, 
Um, this, is, this is a great experience. And what's wonderful about this picture is that each one of these is a good portrait of each one of these ladies. Well, each picture has its own circumstances. Pictures aren't alike, so each, each time a project comes into the studio or, or I know that I'm going to do a different person, you know, they're all, they're all demonstrably different, and so you, you prep yourself and the studio for that person. So yes, they are all different, and, but they all do require concentration. And, and that's what I've learned to do. So I've learned to devote a lot of time to that. I've learned that I do my best work if I take my time and be very patient and kind of let the picture come to me as well as letting me come to it. My hope is just to, to uh, ricochet what they're doing and pass it along so you know, to the best of my abilities. I do feel I have a responsibility uh, but it's not, it, it is a social responsibility, but it's also a human responsibility. People to people, you know, it's, it's, that's what makes the world work. And, and we're seeing so little of that, you know, particularly with, you know, the election of a president who campaigned as a hate monger and wanted to make people dislike each other, distrust each other. So now we have a president that works against every good instinct that I've ever been taught to have or raised to have. And, and um, so I think people to people is certainly the answer. It's not just black lives matter or white lives matter. All lives matter, as they say. And it's up to us to, to share, to share our feelings. Uh, that, that we see something uh, good or bad and we need to reflect on it and talk about it. And as, Journalists have that responsibility. Artists, even more than journalists, I think, have a responsibility to do that because journalism, you, 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 know, you work on a deadline. You've got something to do in a hurry. And artists need to, you know, our, our stock and trade is to absorb things and to, to think about it and to give things time and to think up innovative ways to say things that, that haven't perhaps been used before. And, so I do feel that there's a responsibility, and, but you can only do that if you have a platform, and that's why I so love what the Greenville Museum did. I mean, uh, you know, to, to, to be in an interview on a television station is incredible too, because that's a platform, and I very much appreciate that. But I very much also appreciate the Greenville Museum saying, this work we feel mean something, could mean something to the community for people to see, for all people to see how great their neighbors are, white people and black people can, can visit and see, aha, what we now perceive, you know, perceptions and recognitions is the title of the show, we now perceive that people aren't all alike. This is like what I'm on, the, on this earth to do, is to come back now and do these pictures. The night that show opened for the first time at 5 o'clock, a family walked in at 4.30 with, I think, nine of her family members. And they stood in front of that picture of her. And they all started crying just for the beauty of seeing her on the wall and how good she looked and so forth. In you know, the typical museum openings, people go there as often as not just to meet other people, to network, to pass out business cards. This museum show, people came to be with their neighbors and to share their stories with neighbors they had not yet met. People were meeting people, and on every event they've had in the Greenville show, people were meeting new friends that, that, and passing along contact information about how to work together and do things. So it's been incredibly effective. You can see it happening. You can see the people telling each other, oh, I didn't know you went to that church or I did this, or let's work together. That makes me feel great, you know. Um, I like to see people happy, you know. I mean, I, I, t I take pictures because I love to take pictures, and uh, it pleases me to think that I've done a beautiful picture. But if somebody else thinks it's beautiful, and somebody looks at that person and thinks they're beautiful, this is, this, is, this is a great circle to complete. 
do I feel that I've come full circle? Oh yeah, and that's a really smart question because I knew I wanted to come back to North Carolina, not because it was less expensive to live here, not because, I, I mean, I still love New York. I, I'm probably more at home in New York City than I am in any other place in the world, truthfully. I know every street, I know the good restaurants, I know where to go. I'm streetwise in New York. You know, I've, I've lived homeless in uh, Spain. I've slept under park benches. I've slept in boxcars in Spain. Uh, so I've, I've lived around and I've done things. But I knew that I needed to come back to North Carolina to be amongst the people I grew up with. And I wanted to, I wanted to come specifically back to Eastern North Carolina because I felt like there's a story to tell here that probably I could really tell better than almost anybody because I've gone off, I've become, a, I've become a very practiced photographer, I've developed my craft, I know I'm very good at craft, I know how to compose a photograph, I've spent all these hours and years in art museums, I've worked with mentors, people have taught me things, and, and I've learned about the world a bit, so I needed to be here. I, I needed to tell these stories uh, to other people. So, so for the Greenville Museum to offer me that show was like a dream come true. Well, maybe another museum will do the same thing someday. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to pass along. You know, I think it would be wonderful if museums in many communities would do shows like this. I mean, it doesn't have to all be black people. It can be just people, 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 or but, but do ordinary people, not just celebrities. And, and but do tell the stories of people that that are doing great work and accomplishing wonderful things. So sometimes it takes a little helping hand from someone outside to, to tell these great stories. My history of the Martin Luther King story is started when I was about 20 years old, when my very first magazine assignment ever in my life was to substitute for another photographer who had been asked to go photograph Martin Luther King at home. He was out of town and I was working as his assistant. So the Jet Magazine said, okay, you can go shoot the picture, you know, stand in for, for him. And so my first magazine assignment was to photograph Martin Luther King sitting on his couch in his home as an unknown young pre preacher in, in Atlanta, Georgia, many, many, many years ago. It's not that I hung out with him or knew him personally, but you know, of course I was following his career and I would photograph, I photographed him in his church preaching, I photographed him and his dad when, you know, both at, uh, at, at their church in Atlanta over different periods of time. And, and then, um, you know, I would do all the civil rights demonstrations and things. By then I was working for Life magazine and I would be doing things that had to do with all the riots and getting beaten up and all the rest of it. I was on an assignment in, uh, somewhere and I was flying back to Washington, D.C. and my wife at the time met me at the airport with a bag of film and an airplane ticket. She said, Martin Luther King has just been killed in Memphis. Here's the ticket. So the plane left in 20 minutes and I flew to Memphis and I started photographing. It's a, it's a very tender picture. I like, I like seeing love expressed for him as opposed to anguish at his death. One night late, we were all, there were a bunch of us around, you know, a bunch of photographers had come from out of town. <clears throat> and I was working so hard, I didn't, I don't know that, I, I don't even remember whether I had a motel room or not. I think I was just basically on my feet the whole time. But I remember, um, I, a couple of us, one of the newspaper photographers had, had heard that they were going to open up the funeral home the next morning at like 5.30 or something and let a few people come in and see his body before they closed the casket, put it on the plane and sent it to Atlanta. So I slept on the darkroom floor of that newspaper office. Uh, so I would be there when they got the call that the place was going to open. 
So sure enough, and they were not, the local newspaper photographers were not saying, okay, Burke, they just, they just called us, they're gonna open it up. So we ran, you know, we drove down there, and they opened up the doors, and they let just like 40 people in or something, they just would walk by, and they would pay their respects to Dr. King, and then closed it up, and I, you know, got a, I, you know, maybe shot, had time to shoot three or four rolls of film, one of, a roll of color, out, out of which came the Newsweek cover and this, and then, um, and then two or three rolls of black and white, which you see on the walls of the Greenville Museum. Mm -hmm. And then we followed it, you know, they put it in the hearse and drove it to the airport. We followed it and the photographed it being put on the airplane. And then there's a picture in the Greenville Museum of some, some guys shaking their, their fist as the plane flies away. And it was a very emotional thing to do. We were all in shock. You know, the, all the journalists, the photographers that I knew, we, you know, we, we, were, we were in shock. So, not much you can say beyond that. I mean, it was a, it was a hard time. No, I mean, I loved the man. I loved what he stood for. Um, you know, he, he, uh, he changed our world, and um, a lot of people hated him, a lot of people loved him. Uh, um, he was one of the great leaders of our, our world, and to this day, his stature has grown even more. At the time I did those pictures, I was a member of a, an agency called Magnum, and there were like five or six Magnum photographers down there for the funeral. They didn't get to Memphis. I got there, I beat them all to Memphis, but then they, they came to Atlanta for the actual funeral. And there's a lot of very famous photographers. There. And Cornell Kappa, who is the brother of the great Robert Kappa, war photographer, who was the founder of Magnum, one of the four founders of Magnum. We were, they were all, we, all the Magnum photographers got together and said, who's gonna be where? Cornell said, I wanna be on the platform up there. <laughs> I'll be able to get the whole thing, you know. So he was very proud of himself for getting up there. And um, Philip Jones Griffiths, who was a great Welsh war photographer from Magnum, uh, was, uh, was there. I don't know, Mark Godfrey, another Magnum photographer, was there. Anyway, we all decided, you know, they would pick spots so we'd have the whole place covered. And they said, what, what do you want to do? I said, I don't have any idea. I just want to roam free. That's what I like to do. At the, then we're all back in New York a few days later, and um, another magnet. I was looking at the contact sheets from all the photographers that the coverage it. There are all you know, hundreds of contact sheets on this table. And Ernst Toss says, Burke, you seem to have a lot of you are right there, right there in front of her. Philip, I don't see a whole lot of pictures by you. And he says, That's because every time I would take a picture, I would, what, uh, what, in the foreground would be Burke Ozell's elbows. Because <laughs> I was small. That's a good time to be small, because you can wiggle, and you can do this, and you can get there, and you can, you know, you can be very competitive in a new situation if you're small. Uh, but if you're just, you know, if you're a skinny little short, short guy, then you have, to, you have to use your elbows. So anyway, but then Cornell Kappa, who was on the platform, said, I didn't get anything. <laughs> All I got was the tops of people's heads, you know, so that was the worst possible decision to make. So all those people you saw on that platform were very frustrated at the end of the... It was hard to work in the South as a white photographer for Life magazine and, um, and not be mm, held in contempt by white people. You no, know, I always traveled a lot. I would be here on, I would be back in North Carolina on the Life magazine assignments, one of which was to go photograph a Klan rally in North Carolina, which is a heartbreak. I'd photograph the Klan rally. At the end of the Klan rally, a guy came up and clapped his hand on my shoulder from the back, and I turned around, and he pulled his hood off, and it was a guy I'd gone to high school with in Dunn, North Carolina. So that's one reason I moved out of North Carolina, right there. So 
and then I came back only to have the Republicans uh, take the state house and do the bathroom bill and turn the state backwards again and trying to run it back into the into the past is doing as best they can to, to ruin the state as far as I can tell. So if I had it to do over again right now, I would not move back to North Carolina because of the because of the you know the, the, the way the government has turned things around here. Hopefully Rory Cooper can make a difference, but but it's so I don't know. It's very disappointing to me to as a North Carolina native to see how how it seems to be marching steadily backwards. So and racism is still an issue here. Right here in Wilson, uh, got, if you've got time for one more little story, right, right here in Wilson, North Carolina, since I've lived here, one day on a bicycle ride out in the country, I used to do a 35 mile ride three times a week on my bicycle outside of Wilson. And one fine day I got attacked by a dog and I got hurt really bad. I, you know, fell down the dog, and didn't actually bite me, but messed me up, uh, the, the fall did. I could hardly get back on the bike, I was bleeding. Bad things happened to me, things torn, you know, I was a mess. But I managed to ride back to Wilson very slowly, only using one leg, got to Highway 301, had to cross Highway 301, knew that I, when the light changed, I would not have time to get myself back on the bike, get across the highway before the light changed. I was going to get killed trying to get across 301 Highway, so I called a cab. While I was waiting for the cab, leaning up against the light pole at that intersection, you know, this far from the edge of the pavement, every time the light turned red and, the, and cars would come up, every single black person in every single car carrying them, they would roll down the window and say, can I help you? You're bloody. You look like you need help. And I said, no, no, it's okay. Thank you for asking, but I've called a cab. Not one white person ever did that. Not one. Now you talk about racism, you know. Tell me, tell me where the heart is. And in fact, one homeless guy walking by said, hey man, you don't look so good. Anything I can do to help you? So tell me where the heart is in, in American society. This, this room used to be a freight elevator. And in, when I bought the building, the whole thing was just in ruins. You could actually walk into the building from the, from the alley, from the other side of this. So we decided we put new brick here and we built an inner room out of concrete, um, concrete block, which we then, every one of these blocks is filled with sand. So it's fireproof, waterproof, bombproof. If, you know, if you hear of a, you know, of a tornado coming, this is where you go. Okay. <laughs> come, come see Bert. <laughs> Come see Burke and Janet, get here in time, and go to the bathroom over there, and then come in here, lock yourself in here. <laughs> this is my whole life right here. You know, you've got, um, you know, there's Martin Luther King, Prince, um, um, the names of different books I've done, family named Spot. Um, and when they have red M's like this, these are prints that have been set aside for museum collections when I die. I used to race motorcycles, and for 35 years in a row, I went to a bike week in Daytona and would, would uh, ride my bike one, one day a week, and then the rest of the week I would photograph. And then um, and these drawers are all kinds of magazine stories, and things like that from different magazines, different periods of my life when I was doing a lot more magazine work. Uh, I don't do any of that now, but, but it's, you know, here to someday be in an archive. And um, negatives and contact sheets from the old film days. 
A lot of my work has been collected by the Library of Congress, but then the rest of it is, is here. All the recent work is here. The last few decades are here. That was a wonderful surprise. The, uh, you know, the, it was, it was the, great music festival so it was supposed to be all about the music and it was but so many interesting things happened sociologically that uh, um, th the crowd was so enormous and you know they stopped taking up tickets uh, the New York freeway was closed down uh, it became this momentous event so all of a sudden it was a people's story instead of a music story so uh, and all of the people started taking their clothes off. And that was a wonderful thing. <laughs> the way people were getting along became the story. So my two little boys, or my wife and two sons were with me. When we, we all went in together thinking we would just spend one day there. And uh, then we couldn't get out, so there we were. So to this day, when my my sons who were like this tall, and they're now 57 and 58. To this day when they meet somebody, they say, oh, and, and, and yet I was at Woodstock. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a good time. Oh, they're amused. <laughs> no, they, we've always gotten along well. I mean, they're my best friends, and we've, at different times of their lives, when they were growing up, you know, they were, you know, 19, 20, 21, or something like that. They've each spent a year or so traveling around the world with me, working as an assistant, and uh, and so we. And then we all were riding motorcycles together, so we would all drive around the country doing that. So uh, we've spent a lot of great times together, even though I was traveling a lot, and I would be gone. You know, I, you know, I might go to Vietnam, and while I was there, life would say, okay, well now go over to Borneo and do something there. Oh, and by the way, stop over and uh, do something in, you know, Thailand or something. So I'd be gone for months at a time, but when I was home, I was home. And so there would be, uh, uh, there would be these great periods of intense togetherness, and then I'd be away for a while. So they got used to that. You have to be your own self. That's all you can do. The nice thing about being a photographer is that the world doesn't let you take yourself too seriously. You can't do that because the things you see as you travel around and the people you meet, you stand in, you stand in awe of them. You stand in awe of the world. You don't stand in awe of yourself. You cannot be a functioning artist of any consequence whatsoever if you stand in awe of yourself. That's not the point of the life of an artist or a journalist. If you do that, you need to do something else. One nice thing I've always felt about photography is that no two days are ever the same. And I'm sure it's true of you folks too as journalists. You just never have two days the same. And that keeps you humble. It keeps you hungry and humble. <laughs> and it's touch and go financially to this day, and it always has been all my life. It's not easy. You know, I'm not a trust fund artist. I'm, I was not born wealthy. You know, there are years when I've made more money than others, and but you've, I've had to work hard for it, and the money, I've always put the money right back into the equipment or the studio. So in order to do the work, I felt like I needed to do, so. Most recently, I just did a really wonderful road trip between here and Salt Lake City. So we took pictures all along the way. We knew we had to average about 250 miles a day in the allotted amount of time to get there on time. The first day, we only were able to drive 24 miles because I kept seeing things I wanted to put up. Oh, my God. So then the next day, I think we drove 44 miles. I said, man, we've got to put the hammer down. To, we've got to be in Salt Lake City. And we've now done, you know, 70 miles or something. You know, we've got to get going. 
So and I got a lot of really good new work. I'm very excited about it.